From the STEM Global Action Studios in New Orleans, this is the Let's Talk STEM with SGA's Dr. Calvin Mackey podcast. STEM Global Action is a national leader in creating STEM-based learning activities and delivering them virtually and in communities around the globe to students grades K through 12. Here's today's moderator, Ken Sane. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Let's Talk STEM with Dr. Calvin Mackey. I'm Ken Sane, your moderator. Today we're joined by a special guest, Ms. Jackie Small. She's the Chief Program Officer at Code.org. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jackie. Thank you for having me. And of course, our host and leader, Dr. Calvin Mackey. Hello, Dr. Mackey. Hello, Ken. Hey, this is another one of those days that I'm very, very, very excited about. We have my friend Jackie Smalls here from Code.org. I'm not going to hold us up and brag on her. So let's get it going, Ken. <laughs> All right, Dr. Mackey. So Jackie, you've had such a great career with some amazing accomplishments. You've been an educator. You've written curriculum for, for teachers and schools, as well as you've been an educational administrator. So tell us about Tell us more about yourself, uh, your academic and professional journey, and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Thank you so much, Ken. And I am so appreciative that um, Dr. Mackey um, invited me here today because as he, I consider him one of my mentors. So um, somebody who I look up to and really appreciate all that he's doing in the STEM field and especially his community. So thank you, Doc, for having me. Yeah, you're right. In terms of my career, um, what you didn't mention, um, which I always mention, is that I went to a HBCU. And actually, that's the first time I saw a black woman lead a biology department. And she poured into me and said, you know, you might want to consider going into a STEM field because I always thought about teaching, but I didn't necessarily think about STEM. I was um, at South Carolina State on an ROTC scholarship and they came to me and also said, if you change your major, to engineering or science, we'll actually give you more money. We'll cover your room and board. So I was getting, everything was paid for, but room and board. So to me and my parents, that sounded pretty good. <laughs> so I ended up changing to um, pre-med biology and found myself in the United States Army four years later as an environmental scientist. And that afforded me the opportunity to live in Hawaii for four and a half years. I came back um, to the mainland uh, and I worked out of the Pentagon um, as well as Aberdeen Proving Ground. So that's really where my love for STEM grew. And it came to the point where my husband and I were both in the military. We had to decide who's going to stay and who's going to stay out because we were at a nation at war. And if we wanted to have a family, um, one of us had to make some choices. So I decided um, to exit the army. He stayed in for 24 years. Um, I got out, but I started my career in education and I just saw the intersection of what I loved about science, what I loved about engineering and math and how that could play into my career. And so that's how I pursued um, the pathway of STEM. Uh, great, Jackie. Um, you know, you, you touched on something that, that I want to go back to because the same thing happened in my career, right? I was in school and they came to me and said, look, man, if you major in engineering, we might give you more money. And a lot of my buddies, right, growing up in the communities that we came up in, we didn't know about majoring in engineering and things like that. But in today's society, I mean, is that those type things are still available for kids to get money to go to school in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And a lot of communities don't know about it. Can you speak to that to a certain degree? Absolutely. And I think it's, you know, the opportunity, if we inform our community of the opportunity that's out there, and it may not be a four year college degree that you're looking for, it could be just a, a boot camp, let's say in software development, where you could go to a boot camp and you can um, start a career making $90,000 a year. But I think it's a matter of the education of our community, knowing those opportunities. And we shouldn't have to wait 12 years that I had to wait for someone to say to me, here's some opportunities. I had a guidance counselor. That guidance counselor never, you know, never really looked at my grades and said, hey, these are the different opportunities you might want to think about, especially since I had uh, a scholarship, an RTC scholarship. So I could have went probably most anywhere. I decided to go to an HBCU because I was looking also for that community. And that's what I found and was encouraged um, to go to a STEM field. But I have friends all the time to just yesterday. I have a, a friend who's going to be um, in Buffalo with their daughter this summer. What are opportunities for them to do any type of STEM camps? 
I did what most people can do. I Googled <laughs> STEM <laughs> camps, <laughs> Buffalo, New York, and came up with a long laundry list of opportunities. So information now is more readily available than the <laughs> decades ago when we were in college, Doc, where I think folks have to take the time just to do just a little bit of research, which can take two minutes doing a Google search um, to find out what opportunities actually exist. They're more abundant now than ever. Right. And that's why I'm so happy you said that, because I want to put in a plug for a couple of those sites uh, for the people out there. If you're looking for things for your kids, uh, STEM NOLA has a three million dollar grant from the Department of Defense, DOD STEM. Uh, if you Google DOD STEM and look at their offerings, the Department of Defense have STEM camps from pre-K four all the way through college. So at any level in your kid's life, they will. Get, they will show you the opportunities that's available. And not just in Washington, D.C., but all over the nation as DOD has sites all over the country. Then there's another site by the National Science Foundation that's called pathways to science.org. If you're looking for a summer research experience, summer camp, uh, tutoring, I mean, pathways to science.org is an unbelie unbelievable site that the National Science Foundation has curated uh, for the parents to find this information sourced at one place. And then there's a new website for kids, especially HBCU students who are in college now. Uh, Robert Smith Foundation, Fund 2 Foundation, have created a site called internx.org, specifically for HBCU students looking for internships. And they have major companies like PayPal and other big banks that's partnering with him to make sure that you have access to these amazing opportunities. And when all else fail, just Google internship, Google summer program in your community. And believe me, what we're trying to do at STEM Global Action is be a curator of all this information so you can have a one-stop shop and find it. So Jackie, thank you for that. Uh, tell us about, you know, what you're doing at code.org. You know, parents hear code, code, code. They hear that all the time. And they start asking me, well, what about this coding thing? And we hear these words, but we don't know how they relate to careers and pathways for our children. Thanks, Doc, for that. So at code.org, um, we are trying to make sure computer science is accessible for all students. So just like every kid has to learn math and science and reading, we think that all kids should have the opportunity to learn computer science. Why? Because most kids might have a cell phone. We don't, they don't know how it's operated. They don't know how a computer operates. So why not learn that for yourself? If you're an entrepreneur, which we know kids nowadays, that's what they want to do. I have two young sons. And if you ask them what they want to be, they'll say entrepreneur. And one of the youngest one, um, I said, you know what? We got to put you in coding camp because he believes in crypto and all that other stuff. <laughs> I said, if you want to open your own business, why not create your own app? You're going to pay someone else to, <laughs> to develop your own app, or do you want to develop your own app? And so that's what we're trying to just expose to kids, the opportunities that they have through computer science, whether it be design. And it's not just whether if they want to become a software engineer, developer or not. It's just the opportunity to think critically, be creative. Um, computational thinking and all those skills, no matter what career field that you want to go into, they'll all be applicable to those skills. And so we're just trying to make sure that not just the wealthiest, the affluent schools have computer science, all students should have access to computer science because we know it's a game changer right now. If you look at the careers that will exist, they're typically in that computer science field or STEM field. And why not expose kids to the youngest age possible that this is an opportunity for you and allow them to see themselves in that career field. And the only way we're gonna do that is if we have access and it's accessible to all kids. And so that's what we strive to do every day. We have a K-12 curriculum completely free. So whether you have it in your school or not, parents, you can sign up your students an account and you can learn how to code today. You'll literally learn how to do it for yourself, how to work through what we call a Sprite Lab, which walks you through steps of coding. And so you don't realize, you know, that you're actually doing it. <laughs> it's actually more fun and it's not hard where I think people think about computer science being hard. It's just thinking if I do this, this will happen. That's that's the basics of computer science. Um, and you can take it as far as you want. Yeah, but coding and stuff have changed since we was there. I remember when I was in school and <laughs> they gave us that. basics. Yep. And they gave <laughs> us, you had to learn the code. And the ultimate thing, right, was to make the Pac-Man go across the screen. Mm -hmm. And the Pac-Man eat up the dots. 
you know, and when you do that, you'll jump up like, yeah, I can code. And then I was sitting down with my sons and they were like, daddy, we're going to make this app. And it was all blocked. Right. And it was they was dragging and dropping. And it was about logic and it was about the way you think. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, man, that's not coding. He said, daddy, that is coding. You used to program. Now you program to build the code and we take the code and build something else. So yeah. I want the parents to say, you know, regardless of your experience, you know, whether it be good and a lot of bad when we were coming up, mm-hmm. uh, things have really, really changed. And Jackie keep talking about access. We've got to have access for all. And code is about giving everybody access. But talk about some of the barriers because, you know, we just had COVID and we saw kids, especially in rural areas, sitting outside of Chick-fil-A trying to get the, you know, the Internet. Uh, we had kids in urban areas who didn't have access to 5G and, and cable. Talk about some of those uh, structural things that we should be talking about as a society to make sure our kids can participate in the 21st century. How long do we have, Doc? <laughs> <laughs> because that, you know, I think we were exposed through the pandemic, right? In terms of the gaps, we just, we knew gaps existed, but I think the pandemic just really exposed how big those gaps were and who actually has access. And it's a shame we should there should not we shouldn't have to park a bus in a neighborhood to make sure that all students have access to Wi-Fi. It it just it's it baffles me how we think that this is not something that should be free and accessible to everyone. So you're you're absolutely correct. If you you can have a device, but if you're not connected, then that device is is not going to take you that far. But we also saw that. We could deploy devices in a lot of schools where they were holding back before all of a sudden all these computers and all these laptops were now delivered to schools because that's the only way students were going to learn. And so we know that it can be done. I think we also just have to remember what we have to advocate for. Just because I go to I live grew up in this zip code and if I go two zip codes away, there should be the same opportunities. And we know that those don't exist. So first of all, we need access to broadband, Wi-Fi. That's that's the one. That's where we have to start. And all of these technology companies, if they really want to make a difference, we, I think we should start there, and not just deploy devices because the devices break. They have to have upkeep. They have to have someone to keep inventory. All of those things we don't think about when we say, "Oh, let's gift or donate devices to students." There's more that comes with that. It should be a warranty, a package. It should be the full package, Wi-Fi, and not you know some schools um, that I used to work with. The middle school couldn't take attendance <laughs> when high school was taking attendance because right. that's how bad the system was. Right. And now we're going to be exposed even more because now all of these devices have been deployed. Well, guess what? They're about to break. And when they break, then what are we going to do? So now we relied a system on computers and we, what are we going to do? Shift back to the way we were because now we don't have the devices that are upgraded. So all of these things we have to think about in a holistic way, not just the stop gap that we saw during the pandemic. Very interesting. Let's talk about uh, career opportunities for a second. You know, there was a, a recent survey that came out and it showed two things that I really would like to get both of you you to respond to. It shows that number one, uh, a majority of black Americans say that if there were more examples of people like you, blacks who are high achievers in STEM, that that could actually help young people see themselves as a, see STEM careers as something that they could pursue. And then conversely, the survey shows that a lack of representation uh, often keeps young people from seeing STEM fields as being open to the, to this. Please talk to us about that. I'm curious for your views, both of you. Doc, you want to go first? Uh, you know, for me, it almost makes sense, right? If I could see myself, there's a saying that says, if you, if you can see it, you can believe it. And everyone knows that. That's why we live in a country right now that where the NFL and the NBA make sure that primarily black and brown boys touch a football before the age of four. And they've mm-hmm. created pathways, camps. They've created all of the things that a, that a young boy would need to maintain his interest and his inspiration in sports to somewhat one day achieve that dream. But also what they've done is that they make sure in a in a in a holistic way and in, in, in a in a most powerful way that they can is to present the stories of these athletes that yearn at your heart and really speak to your somebodyness and, and show them that they've show that they've overcome it. They show their lifestyle, but we don't do that for especially African Americans, especially women in other areas. And we know those are the things 
that really change lives. I mean, in STEM, we, we believe in the STEM. So we bring in a robot or we bring in a science experiment. And our arrogance say those who's interested in this, they walk out with it. And those that walk out, those are the ones that we want. And that isn't the case. We know people, especially kids in low income, low resource communities, buy into people before they buy into things. So if we really want to change the paradigm, if we really want to change the narrative, show them somebody like them with a story very relative to their existence to let them know that what we're telling them is actually possible rather than some pipe dream. And it has to be represented throughout a student's experience, right? It shouldn't just be, I, I, I was at fault when I had the classroom. Did I have a picture of Michael Jordan saying he tried to shoot so many baskets and failed so many times, you know, failures, not, you know, all of that. Did I have pictures of those that look like Doc or me that said, here's a scientist or here's an engineer? No. Why? Well, maybe those posters didn't actually exist then, but they do now, right? And so, Students need to see that it's achievable, that it's possible, but we can't lie to them either, that it's going to be difficult sometimes because right. until we make it a majority of us that actually are in the field, it can be lonely. So we need to build, build community around our students that want to go in this pathway. We need to have some mentorships. Um, I know I find it a personal responsibility of my own to make sure that I give back. I never turn down an opportunity to speak to students. I can be busy as I want to be, but I know that kids need to see. And, I, and when they see it, when I see a young lady look up and they say, you actually know something about STEM, you know something about science. Um, when I was in middle school, I had to sub for um, a male white teacher and I came in and started solving equations. The students looked at me and they said, well, how do you know how to do that? <laughs> Mrs. Smalls, how do you know that? You, you too cute to do that, Miss Smalls. How do you know all this? I said, you could be cute and smart at the same time. Come on now. And so they just have to see those, those possibilities and hear the stories like Doc was saying. It wasn't easy. I know Doc's story wasn't easy. If I told my story, not necessarily parts of my life wasn't easy. But we have to make sure that there's community, that we're well informed of the opportunities that we talked about earlier. And we have to make sure that we um, are seen and we are heard and we're giving the opportunities just like everybody else. Um, and we also have that community of support beyond K-12, within colleges and beyond an industry. I had a student tell me that she walked into a college class in her computer science class, black girl. I think she was a freshman or sophomore, sat down. The professor came to her and said, are you in the right class? Oh. So if she's literally asked that question and she signed up for that class and asked, I'm sorry, are you in the right class? What does that do to her? and her belief that she should belong there. And it doesn't, in, in a PWI, you should belong there just like you belong at an HBCU. And even when, why would I go work at one of these big tech companies if nobody around me looks like me? You, you're, <laughs> no. not, you're not gonna wanna do it. So we have to also say, okay, you're pouring into these, you know, we hear about all this diversity, equity and inclusion. Well, I need to see people on the board, that look like me. I need to see those that are influences that look like me in these big tech companies. So it's not just an initiative, but it's part of the culture of the organization so that our kids can see that they belong there just like everyone else. You know, I'll never forget when I, I went to Georgia Tech, I had gone to Morehouse, HBCU, transferred to Georgia Tech. I got a mathematics degree from Morehouse and I registered for like a 6,000 level mathematics course. And a professor was teaching, he turned around, he just stopped. He said, are you in the right place? I said, man, I registered for math 6,052. I said, when black men just begin to wander into 6,000 level math courses and not know where they are, I said, we have arrived. And the whole class bust out laughing, right? <laughs> but, it, you know, I'm so sorry. It's, those type things are still happening. But I want to take this opportunity to say at STEM Global Action, we are deploying a STEM NOLA model across the country because just all the things that Ms. Bowers talked about, those are the things that we are doing. We believe we've created a high functioning STEM community. We bring K-12 kids together. We surround those K-12 kids with college students who we pay and train. Then we surround those college students with STEM professionals and educators who volunteer. So at any given time, a young man, a young woman can see him or herself at any station in life. And we call that vertical mentoring. It's not enough just to give them the coding or the computer science or the STEM, but we got to bring that human factor 
uh, piece into the game so that they'll know that there's somebody out there who's done this and paved the path such that this is this is, I'm not a unicorn, right? And give them the ability to see those people, touch those people, and talk to those people. And those are the things, the intersectionality of that human capital and that human capital that's transforming transforming lives. So thank you, Jackie, for definitely uh, bringing that up. So Jackie, one question. This has been fantastic, but what advice do you have for parents and families who may see this or learn more about code.org? How, what advice do you give them on how to talk to uh, school administrators or teachers about making sure that their children have access to computer? computer science courses? Yeah, I would do just like most parents, you know, question, why is it that this isn't available for my students? Mm. Explain to me, what are the factors that are preventing for us to have this opportunity here in the school? Um, is it teachers? Is it funding? Because guess what? We offer that professional learning to teachers. And most of the time we have many opportunities where it's free. So there's not a it's not a word. Well, we need money in order to do this where we have those opportunities available. So I would say question everything. Question why am I not? Why is my child being put in the keyboarding? But you're acting as if it's a computer science class. Keyboarding is not a computer science class. Right. And so it's asking a lot of questions because we might not know what opportunities exist or what should be the criteria, right? So we just simply ask, well, why is it that you placed my student in, in this particular class where I see you know, that others are being placed in this class and this opportunity is available? So it's asking those questions. Um, I think it's also demanding at the same time too, demanding high quality education, high quality teachers and, and opportunities. Um, why don't we have this special programming, after school programming? Why doesn't it exist here? There's a lot of funds out there and I won't get into all the political terms and um, funding that we have based on the pandemic, but there's a lot of money right now that schools can't even figure out what are you going to do with all the money? That's right. <laughs> so that's not, funding is not an issue right now. Now I understand as a teacher um, and has have two kids that are, are, you know, one in college and one um, currently at school that we are dealing with the teacher shortage. In some places we're dealing with administrative shortages. Some, you know, we have those issues, but at the same time, funding is available. Um, there's opportunities that are available. And most of the boundaries that existed in the past aren't necessarily existing right now. It's a matter of making it an effort or a priority in schools that they want these opportunities for all students, not just certain students or all, you know, all students, not just tracking certain students. Oh, this gifted child should be in this class. I think all students are gifted. Even if a student has a special need, guess what? They're gifted because they're they might lack in some other area, but they're probably gifted in another area. So it's not, you know, let's let's make sure that students have a choice. And that's not what they typically don't have because someone's deciding for them. And if you're not getting answers by the school, then let's call the school board. And if you're not getting answers by the school board, let's go to the central office and get the answers that you're asking for, because we have to advocate for our students. And if we're not, we don't know those questions, go to the guidance counselors. Um, can you explain to me what are the choices or what should be the choices? Ask those questions. Demand, they know that they have the information um, and I can't see why they wouldn't necessarily share it. So I think we have to ask, we have to advocate. And then if we can't get that, then we just simply go to our community and say, you know what, let's demand this together. Let's just show up at all show up at a school board meeting together and say, why doesn't this happen? Because, you know, in numbers, certain things tend to get um, pushed and moved. And, you know, that is, you're, look, you're, hey, you're preaching now because that's what's <laughs> happening with STEM NOLA. We came to the community. We started doing all this STEM. We started exposing the kids, but the Trojan horse is really the kids, right? The kids in the STEM. So the parents start seeing the kids in the STEM and the kids do STEM that they were not getting at school. So now parents are saying, how can I get this in a playground when my kid is not getting this in school? So we're seeing kids, we're seeing parents uh, more engaged than we, we, we've ever had before. And now we're influencing what's happening in school because the parents feel empowered to go fight for their kids. Mm -hmm. But Brother Ken, Brother Ken, do you see why I wanted Jackie on the podcast? I get it. I get it, man. I follow your lead, brother, brother minister. No problem. <laughs> so, Jackie, is it can parents can parents turn parents and family members? Can they turn to code.org for more information? Oh, absolutely. 
code.org. That's all you have to go to. <laughs> That's easy. That's very, code. very code. Right now. And there's, even, <laughs> there's a new movie coming out called Bad Guys. And actually it talks about a character in the movie that does computer science. And so right now, if you go to our website, you're going to see that the movie Bad Guys. And they talk about how computers, everyone needs someone to think critically. Right. And you see the mm -hmm. little character um, typing away at the keyboard. And so we're highlighting what's in an animation, what's actually what kids can learn. And then it will show them how they could learn to code and get one of those characters that are in the movie um, um, through a coding activity. So we try and engage students in all different ways. But yes, you go to code.org, you can learn how to bring computer science to your school. You can have your students start coding right away. Um, and even parents, they love to participate with their, uh, their students. I know I had my son try it out and I started staying on the computer beyond the time he left. So even parents can learn how to do it. It's not just their students. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much. Jackie, yeah. before we go, uh, Dr. Mackey, you want to give your final question or comment to, to Jackie? No, I, I was going to tell Jackie, you know, she's she's spot on. Recently, I was with the, um, the I believe, the president of the Southern Law uh, Law School here in, in, in Baton Rouge. And he was talking about how he's opening a a gaming, you know, esport center at the law school. And everybody like, what are you doing? And he said, well, Technology is infused in so many areas. I have to make sure that my lawyers are, are properly equipped with all of this exposure so that they can represent companies. And that's why I almost look at coding almost as coding as a second language, right? I believe we're doing our kids a disservice by not giving them this from cradle to career because no matter what career they go into, at some aspect of it, they're going to have to have some fundamental understanding of coding and not coding in its pure form uh, definitely computer science and the broader nature of how it's impacting uh, every profession. Every profession or use of your phone. Who has that, you know, face recognition when you open your phone? <laughs> Somebody, yeah. that technology is there. And the day that my parents call me and say, how do I do this? We know it has arrived. Technology <laughs> is here. It's not going anywhere. Right. And I'm not their help desk. But that's typically what they call me for. Uh, but we know that our world is, I, I don't know what we do. If, if technology dropped out, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do, Doc? Hey, I don't know. But Jackie, I just want to say thank you. I mean, I can listen to you forever because the most beautiful uh, part of your narrative is that you were a teacher that has transcended the, the teaching space from a classroom, but now you're teaching a uh, society. And do, through your experiences and through uh, your, your, you know, your, your background as a teacher and, you know, juxtaposed with that as a parent, I believe you have a voice that every mother and every father need to hear because it's credible, credible, it's transparent and it's authentic. And I want to say thank you for being you. Thank you for doing all that you do. And, you know, you got my number. Just holler. And uh, I'm ready. I'm on the battlefield with you. So thank you. <laughs> Always and can't wait till you bring STEM NOLA to the DMV. So we're ready for you. <laughs> we're on our way. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Thank you, Jackie, for being our guest today. We really appreciate it. Uh, we hope you'll come back as, as, as soon as you can. You always have a place here. Anytime. I'm. Thank you for having me today. And thank you for what you're doing, ensuring that folks get the information that they need so that we can provide those opportunities to our students because we know they deserve it. Very good. Well, that's our episode for Let's Talk STEM. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you'll follow us on all our social media channels. You've been listening to a STEM Global Action Podcast. Through our STEM-based programming, we put students on a path towards quality jobs in science, technology, engineering, and math. Visit us at www.stemglobalaction.com. Until next time, Let's keep talking STEM.